Hi, everyone. I am back in the United States, and can you believe it? I returned two days ago, and you're not, well, I'm not having you wait for three or four months for an update. So this update, or rather this video, has three purposes. Number one, an update of a number of the things that happened while in Turkey. Um, number two, go through some scriptures um, to explain a number of the things that happened in Turkey, as well as um, provide some scriptures for individuals that I met while there in order to explain that, or not even explain, read the, the red letters, right? Read the red and read all of the scriptures as it relates, read all of a verse as it relates to when we read scripture, you can't just stop reading at a comma or a semicolon. Read the entire verse. Forget about even reading the script, the, the context. Yes, read the context, the verses before it, the verses after. But I met people who are not even reading the full verse. This will not be a, okay, y'all, y'all got to get right video. No, this will be a Bible study of scriptures that make it very clear. Number one, that we are to go into all the world, all the nations, and preach the gospel to all creatures, right? All of creation and miracles, signs, and wonders will follow us. Those of us who believe, not necessarily those who don't believe, right? Okay, so so get into Istanbul, went, got through immigration, everything was fine, got to accommodations. Now, one of the things I did not share um, with everyone, especially when I sent that video prior to leaving, is that the area that I was going to be residing in for my time in Istanbul specifically was the Tuskin, Tuskin area. Now that area, and I, for the people who is going to give me a side eye, even though you're looking at this video, right? But still in your heart, give me a side eye. Um, the area that I was in was the area that was recently bombed. When I say recently, back in November, um, it's the Tuskim area of Istanbul, which again, it's an area where you have diplomats, ambassadors, accommodations, and all of that. Um, number two, I arrived on Saturday and met up with some friends on Saturday. And then Sunday, I did not go to the church that I was scheduled to go to. Whole other story. However, I did end up going to, I believe, it's the first Christian church that was in Istanbul. Well, when I say first Christian, I'll put the link for the church in um, the, the description area, but it's called River Church of Istanbul, Istanbul. And I'm like, okay, God, why am I going to this church? It's not that I, I everybody knows I love the church, church folk, that's a whole nother story, because Jesus is coming back for the church, right? So I was scrolling, just looking while they're looking for churches, as well as actually a couple of days prior to leaving. And the name of this church literally jumped off the screen. And I said, okay, God, what is going on? So I walked into the church and it is a predominantly, it has it's a predominantly African church. It's a Nigerian pastor, Pastor Godwell. See, Samuel, I got it right, Godwell. And... I thought, okay, here, here we go. Uh, it, okay, so Pastor Godwell, one of the things that people who know me, I give preachers 15 minutes. You got 15 minutes. If you're going to, going to um, take this word and butcher it, I'm out, right? Or if I just start seeing things. Now, anyway, I walk in, people are really kind and all of that. But then Pastor Goodwin starts to minister and he's preaching the gospel. He's preaching scripture. He says, turn your Bibles too. And so the fact that he's not, okay, don't worry about turning there. Look on the screen or I'll just read it. No, no. He's constantly saying, 
turn your Bible to, let's read X, Y, Z. And so that already had me, I said, okay, we, this, we, we, this is one of those apostate churches. I'm just saying, okay. And ended up meeting some wonderful people and then ended up um, later the next day. Okay. So my days are mixed up. Um, Monday ended up going to Izmir, flying out to Izmir. Everything was fine. Um, the, the driver, security, everything was great. Uh, I'm trying, well, let me stop trying to make this video short. End up getting back into the airport in Izmir while there sitting in Starbucks. I'm talking to this woman and her companion and the, I, how do I explain? Long story short, the woman explains that she's always had these headaches. Obviously it's demonic. And I was like, would you mind if I pray to Jesus to heal you? And again, through translate, yeah, sure. So I lay, I asked, would you mind if I lay, put my hand on your head? And she said, yeah, sure. Muslim woman, wait for it. And well, side note, don't be letting everybody put their hands on your head. That's number one. And if you're going to put your hands on people's head, please ask if it's okay, if they can, you can put your hands on their head. But anyway, so I put my hand on her head and I just said, Jesus, Please give her revelation, understanding who you are, how you are, and heal her. And when I moved my hand, he went like this and says to her companion, I felt like I was going to fall, but I'm sitting down. And so she grabs my hand and looks at my hand. And it was like, and she's like, what? And I said, that's Jesus. I feel the presence of God right now. And I said, that's Jesus. And I said, on a scale of one to 10, what is it? So the companion said it is uh, two, three. So I prayed again and the woman grabbed my hand again and wanted to take me or said want, she wants me to come with her to her family in order for me to pray for the rest of her family. I was like, no, we don't, no. Okay, so fine. So that was leaving Izmir back to um, Istanbul. So let me go to some verses because the testimonies, I mean, yes, you all have heard testimonies multiple times, right? But I must share this with you. Okay. So like I said, the, the video is, mo is threefold, right? So Mark 16, the great commission, right? And there's a reason why I have the specific scriptures, okay? This is after Jesus's resurrection, right? I'm going to make this small because seeing me is not important at all, right? Okay, put this down here. So, hold on. All right. Well, that's just weird. Okay. Yeah, but then you guys are like, okay, let me just put this here. Actually, we put it down here. Okay. So we're going to go to Mark 16, right? So this is after Jesus has risen. And he's talking to the disciples and he gets a great commission, right? He says, and to them, verse 15, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every crea creature. Yes, every creature. He who, I have a, I, I know someone who actually laid hands on, on her dog. That's a whole nother story. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, right? And he who does not believe will be condemned. I'm not going to stop right here, but keep verse 16, right? In your mind. Why? Because John 3, 16, that everyone knows God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. We'll get to it in a minute, right? Okay. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Notice it says, will be condemned. Wait for it. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. Let's, let's make sure everybody's clear. Speaking in tongues, right? Rebo Korosha, that tongues as well as foreign tongues. 
I can give you testimonies where God allowed me to speak in Spanish fluently, where everybody looked at me, stopped, and I didn't even feel as though I had control of my tongue. And Chichewa, which is a native language in Malawi of a tribe. That's a whole nother story. They will take up serpent, serpents and they will drink anything deadly, unless you're lactose intolerant. But that's a whole nother story. We can play for the, pray for that. It will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover, okay? It doesn't say that lay hands on the Christian, all right? And here in the amplified version, it says, he who believes, who adheres to and trusts in and relies on the gospel and him who is set forth and is baptized will be saved from the penalty of eternal death. But he who does not believe, who does not adhere to and trust in and rely on the gospel and him whom it set forth will be condemned. D just give me, give me a second. We're going to get to it. Now, Matthew 28, again, the Great Commission. When they saw him, they worshiped him. This is again after Jesus was resurrected. But notice it said, but some doubted. I'm not even going there right now. They saw the resurrected Jesus Christ, right? And yet some doubt it. People who preach that you can doubt, use the scripture and says, oh, even the disciples doubted Jesus. And even after the resurrection, people doubted G the disciples. Notice it says 11 disciples. So that means when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted, meaning some of the 11 doubted. But wait a minute. This was before Jesus Christ, God, Holy Spirit stepped into their mortal bodies in the book of Acts. But I digress. Okay, wait. Jesus says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I'm not gonna get into the conversation or debate with people who says, no, it's just the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit or just the Holy Spirit or just the Son. Okay, fine. Teaching them to observe all things. Why are you going into the nations? Baptize them, right? Preaching the gospel, making disciples and teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So you're not just going into all the nations to cast out demons, raise the dead, heal the sick, preach the gospel. Yes, that is what you are to do. But you are also going into the nations to make disciples right? And to teach them to obey. That means not just going into the villages and singing songs. Nothing's wrong with singing, singing songs, vacation, Bible school. There's nothing wrong with that. But you are to teach people how to obey the word of God. But how do you teach people who are Christians, or I won't say in the church, Christians, right? Little Christ, how do you teach them to obey? Well, you have to understand what it is that they understand about the word and then point out what they're not obeying in the word. The Amplified Version <clears throat> says, God authority and command me, actually, let me make sure it is, excuse me, the message version. Jesus under, undeterred went right ahead and gave them this charge. God authorized, this is Jesus speaking, authorized and commanded me to commission you, the disciples, Go out and train everyone you meet far and near. That is yes to other nations, but also next door. In this way of life, marking them by baptism in the threefold name, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Then instruct them in the practice of all I have commanded you. I will be with you as you do this day after day, day after day, right up to the end of the age, end of this age, meaning the years, right? Because when Jesus returned, time stops. Now that, okay, that, that's a whole nother story. Okay, let me, before we go into to Romans, let's go to John 3, 16. So well, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life, right? For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, right? But that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned. 
But then here's where everybody, you know, starts shouting, boogity, 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 boo. Right? Okay, wait. But he who does not believe is condemned already. Remember, and Mark, it says, will be condemned. But John says, you are condemned already because you do not believe. Because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten son. And this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world and the men love darkness. Not just men, men and women, men meaning humanity, loved darkness, right? Rather than light, Jesus Christ is the light. We'll get to John 1 in a minute. Because their deeds were evil. Now here's the thing, and I was having conversations while at Istanbul about this. Do people love darkness because of the evil deeds or do people have evil deeds because they love darkness? Well, Ephesians says that you were once darkness. It doesn't say you were once in darkness. And it says that you were dead in sin, but we won't go to that right now. And this condemnation that the light has come into the world and the men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Verse 20, for everyone practicing evil, meaning you practice, you're good at it, right? There's not a day that goes by, maybe a day where you just stay in the house and you don't interact with other people. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, not necessarily into the light, to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. The reason some of you do not want Jesus is because you love darkness. You love evil. You don't think what you do is evil, but anything outside of God, because your existence is darkness, is evil. Here's the thing, when I became born again, and yes, I'll share this until the day I die, God showed me every single thing that I did that was good, rather that the world said was good. And he showed it that it was evil because number one, it was being done in my own strength, in my own power, for my own glory. It wasn't for God. It was for me to be like. It was for me to have other people like other people. It was for motives outside of glorifying God. So if you do anything that is outside of God, right? I'm not talking about Christians who do things that God didn't ordain necessarily for them to do, right? That you won't get rewards for. It's a good thing, not a God thing. I'm talking about those who are not in Christ, right? Because when you become born again, all things have passed away. It doesn't say all evil things. It says all things have passed away because you have become new. Ugh. Okay. For everyone practicing evil, verse 20, takes the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds become exposed. 21. But he who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen that you have, that they have been done in God. Okay, where am I going with this? Again, it, it, it's just a lot. Where am I going with this? I met individuals who do not share the gospel, right? They do not evangelize, do not preach the gospel, do not tell people about Jesus, okay? From that whole week, even before going to Israel, uh, Israel, going to Istanbul, going to Turkey, right? I was having conversations with individuals where they said, well, you know, Beverly, it's, it's you, you know, you have, you have that personality. Okay. Wait a second. I thought Jesus Christ is supposed to be your personality. By the way, side note, all those, um, behavioral analysis, what's your behavioral type and all of that. Do you know that a lot of those tests that I've seen even given in the church were created by new age satanic psychologists, psychiatrists. But I digress. You can do your own research with that. Okay, fine. Side note. So I'm having these conversations with people and I'm like, how is the Jesus in you not crying out for the soul, for the person that you're talking to that doesn't know him? How are you not sharing Jesus Christ or the gospel with your family members? And let's be clear. You can share the gospel with your family members and not beat them with the gospel. But here's the thing. 
they beat you with their evil. So why aren't you beating them with the gospel? Oh, because we, you know, we don't want to be Bible thumpers. I'm a Bible thumper. I'm, I'm a Bible thumper. And uh, as a uh, South African friend would say, I'm a Bible thumper. Because if they can drink, smoke, curse, and all of that, why, especially in the Western church, they're like, oh, you don't want to beat people over the head with the Bible. Why not? They beat you over the head with their profanity and their evil, with their everything that's good in the world that's evil. Why not use scripture? Why not present Jesus? Why not say, okay, that's evil? And not to say you tell them that's evil and tell them to stop because they can't stop because they're not born again. But why are we... Uh, chain tucking and not sharing Jesus with people. And yet we call ourselves Christians, right? Oh, in America, we say, oh, you have to have a relationship first. Show me, show me, I'll, I'll insert a video of a friend saying, show me the scripture. Here's that video. But okay, so here's the thing. Romans... Romans 1, right? Oh, okay. Okay, so because people, you know, say, oh, people are in darkness. Okay, let's read Ephesians 5, right? Ephesians 5, 8. For you were once darkness. You were once darkness. Not you were in darkness. So if you are not saved, the Bible calls you darkness, right? Because Jesus Christ is light. Here, the Amplified Classic, for you were once darkness. Yes? They're talking to people in, the, in Ephesus, right? This is book of Ephesians chapter five. But now you are light. So when you're in Christ, you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Finding out what is acceptable to the Lord and have no fellowship with unfruitful works of darkness. Who? Not darkness demons, darkness people, right? But rather expose them. For it is shameful to even speak of those things which are done by them. Them. Who? Those who are in darkness or who are darkness in secret. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light. You, the light. For whatever makes manifest is light. Right? So when we preach the gospel, right? Or some people want to say share the gospel. I don't understand the sharing because the Bible says preach it which is proclaim, herald it, the good news. We are speaking to individuals who are in darkness. And I had a conversation with someone who said, well, you know, there's going to people who are going to perish and, you know, uh, uh, they're perishing because the, 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 the demons or the devils of this age or the rulers and the powers of this age has blinded them. We'll get to that scripture in a minute, right? But here, the thing about not sharing the gospel with people is that you approve their darkness and you co-sign their darkness, right? And when you're co-signing their darkness, you are saying, oh, I don't care if they go to hell for eternity. And a side note before I go over to the next scripture, here it says, oh, the, the comment that, oh, we need to wake up the church and we need to wake up the body of Christ. Help me understand how the body of Christ is sleeping. Because notice here, it says, therefore, verse 14, he says, awake you who sleep. Arise from the dead. If you are sleeping, then you are dead. And Christ will give you light. Why does Christ have to give you light? Because you are darkness. So this whole thing of, oh, the body is Christ asleep or the sleeping church, is it's a sleeping giant. Uh, Jesus is forever making intercession at the right hand of the Father, right? He doesn't sleep, God doesn't sleep, nor does he slumber. So how is it that we're waking up a church? Or are we saying that we, people who are in the body, who make up the body, not church folk, 
People who make up the body of Christ are sleeping. I've never met a born again person who sleeps or is sleeping. Here for you were once darkness. For once you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Lead the lives of those native born of light. And verse 14 here, therefore he says, awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall shine, make day dawn upon you and give you light, right? Ephesians 5, 15, you can go read it and study it. But here's the thing. If you don't preach the gospel, you co-sign people in their darkness, in darkness. Again, the conversations that I was having the week prior to leaving for, the, um, for Turkey is the conversations that I was having while in Turkey. Okay, here we go. You cannot continue to say you are, are a Christian. And I'll keep saying it because other people are not saying it. Yes, we are to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling, right? At the same time, it says, judge those who are among us, the workers that we engage in church with, right? Hold on, let me get that scripture because I, there's gonna be a couple of people who's like, oh, well, Beverly, hold on. Okay, so here we go. First Corinthians chapter five. Paul says, I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with sexually immoral people. Yet I certainly did not mean with sexually moral people of this world or with the covetous or extortioners or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world, right? Jesus prayed in John 17 to keep us in the world, right? Keep us while we're in the world. Verse 11, but now I have written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother who is sexually immoral or covetous or an idolater, or a reveler, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, not even to eat with such a person. For what have I to do with judging those also who are outside? Do you not judge those who are inside? But those who are outside, God judges. Therefore, put away from yourself the evil person. So again, people, everybody who's in church, it's not in Christ. The Bible is clear. There are wheat and tear growing up together. And yes, it says that we are not to separate them, right? God will do that. At least you pluck up the wheat, right? However, this clear scripture is very clear that there are those who are in the church, not the body of Christ, not sinning Christians, I am talking about people who engage in behavior that they have shown that they make a practice of sin, letting us know that they are not part of the body. Uh, where am I going with this? One of the things, one of the conversations that I had while in, while on a call, actually, well, that's a whole nother story. While in Istanbul is you cannot preach a gospel here in the States or there in Europe or even in Nigeria or South Africa or more developed areas of the world that you can't preach to the underground churches in China or to the Syrian pastors that are being persecuted who came into Turkey and are going back into Syria and may not make it this month or this week because they got their heads cut off. That whole, or this whole, you know, you can do it and Rod, yes, you know, encourage you and God is by your side and you can do it and trust God. Like, when are we going to start, when are we going to start requiring people who proclaim to be Christian to actually walk like it? And when they don't call it out, so they're not even, so they're not walking deceived, believing that they're born again, when in actuality, Nothing about them proclaims that Jesus Christ is Lord outside of when God gives them or they believe God has given them something. In my previous video, I shared with you that I'm around multimillionaires. So these people who have money and wealth and houses and cars don't know Jesus. 
don't want Jesus. Forget about them. I had money and cars, private drivers. I, I didn't know Jesus. That was all of the devil. The devil gave it to me, y'all. And yes, for those who said, well, you know, God draws us with his goodness. Okay, so his goodness is that you're still alive, that you have oxygen, air going into your nostrils, into the lungs that he gave you, and that he has not allowed the devil to take you out and you go to hell for eternity. That is God's goodness. God's goodness is healing the Muslim woman or Muslims that I have met where they've been asking, is Isa or Yeshua, is he real? Is he truly God? Or is Allah really God? And then them having an encounter with Jesus Christ in their dreams. Or someone comes to them and say, hey, you've been having a dream and asking if Jesus Christ is really the son of God and God manifested in the flesh. Those testimonies, thousands of them are happening every day. However, in the churches, in the developed nations or in the developed areas of nations like Istanbul, like in Abuja, Nigeria, or Lagos, or in um, Johannesburg, right? And, and just in, in different parts of the world, we must make sure that we are not only studying scripture, reading scripture, discussing scripture, but we as a body is holding each other accountable to the things that come out of our mouths, the things that we do, the things that we don't do for God, for Christ. John 1, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Who? The word. All things that were made were made through him and without him, nothing was made that was made. In him was life and the life of the light of men. In him, verse four, was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There's a lot that can be, that can be said for each of these, but here's the thing. Having conversations with individuals who are more Calvinistic leading, who do not believe that they need to preach the gospel or God will move on their heart, and share the gospel and that they don't need to share with everyone because everyone is not going to be born again. And everyone can't rather be born again. Here's the thing. And they actually said that they don't pray for their family members anymore because clearly they're not going to be born again. So here's the thing. Everything that was made was made through a crucified Christ, right? Now, if everyone and everything, everyone, was made through a crucified Christ, that means every single person who was born and will be born was made through Jesus Christ, who was crucified before the foundation of the world. So you don't not share the gospel because, or preach the gospel because you're already like, okay, this person's annoying me, or this person is trying to kill me, literally, um, or this person has done something to me and I don't, I don't want to share the, 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 the gospel with them. Every single person was made through a crucified Jesus Christ, which means they have no excuse. Now here's in Romans one, where it talks about the, well, not talks about, it says, Verse 18, 118, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. So in order for you to suppress the truth, you have to know the truth. Here's the thing, because what may be known of God is manifest in them for God has shown it to them. Now, this is for everyone where it's the question is, well, what happens if there's someone in a remote village who never hears the gospel? No, they will hear the gospel. Jesus will make himself and has made himself known. God has made himself known to all creatures. Here we go. Verse 20, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, invisible attributes are clearly seen being understood by the things that were made even his eternal power and Godhead so that they are without excuse. Who? The individuals who are suffering the wrath of God. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful. 
I will not discuss ungrateful, self-centered people right now, hmm. but became fruitile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darkened or yes, darkened. Verse 22, professing to be wise, my PhD, MBAs, MAs, double dual degrees, JDs, MDs, professing to be wise became, they became fools and changed the glory of an incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible men, corruptible man, my superstar worshipers, my watching movies and being addicted to genres of film where they literally have witches and warlocks praying, decreeing things, calling in people to watch this film. Again, this is associated with conversations I had prior to leaving to Israel. Um, Israel. Everybody who's going to Israel, bless you. Prior to leaving for Turkey, God into an image excuse me, and change the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible men and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things, right? So there is no excuse. Job, uh, people be sleeping on the book of Job, but here's the thing, Job chapter 12, verse seven. But now, and this is Job asking, to ask Job answering his friends, right? Here, but now ask the beast, and they will teach you. Ask the birds of the air and they will tell you or speak to the earth and it will teach you. And the fish of the sea will explain to you. Who among all those does not know that the hand of God has done this? Done what? What was happening to Job, right? In whose hand is the life of every living thing and the breath of all mankind? In whose hand is the life of every living thing? Okay, where am I going with this? My question to everyone who again proclaims Christ. I didn't say everyone who calls himself Christian. Everyone who proclaims that Jesus Christ is Lord. How are you not sharing, preaching, teaching the gospel, making disciples, reading scripture to people who are in darkness, who are darkness rather, and with people who know Jesus. So you both or all of us can read and study scripture together and find out, hey, how, what did the Holy Spirit say to you about the scripture? What did the Holy Spirit say to you about the scripture? Not what, oh, what I think this means. And I believe this can correlate with this assessment of understanding the duality of the nature of man. Like, seriously, seriously, this is how we're studying scripture. Looking at the duality of man. What's the duality of man? The Bible says a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. And have you ever realized when it says a double-minded man, meaning there's there's two minds, there's yours and whose. We're supposed to have the mind of Christ, right? Okay, let's keep going. You're like, where is she going? I'm, I'm going somewhere. In Genesis 2, going back to verse 7. Then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground. He breathed the breath of life into man's nostrils. We just read, right? The breath of life into the man's nostrils and the man became a living person. So every single person who is breathing, who is breathing, God breath breathed into your nostrils so you can become a human, a, a breathing live human being, right? When Adam and Eve disobeyed God and fell, they didn't die. They became disconnected from God, disconnected from being one with God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit. But when we become born again, we become reconnected. They are now in us and we are in them. I'm going to close this out and go to John 14, where it says, verse 15, if you love me, you can't love Jesus without having received Jesus. It's not possible. You have to receive Jesus Christ in order to become born again. Let's go back to verse chapter one. There was a man, excuse me, not that one. Chapter, uh, verse 10, chapter one. He was in the world and the world was made through him. This is again, referring back to 
Jesus in the beginning was the word, the words with God, everything that was made, right? He was in the world and the world was made through him. And the world did not know him. He came to his own. Some people preach that he came to his own, meaning the Israelites, right? But let's read. He came to his own and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, the many, not Israelites and Israelites, to them, he gave the right to become children of God. How did you become the child of God? You received Jesus. It didn't say you just believe him. Yes, the scripture says, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth. Well, how can you believe something in your heart? You can only believe in Jesus if you receive the conviction of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, from hovering over the water. So the Holy Spirit is involved in creation of creation. That's a whole nother story. Huh? But because the Holy Spirit was involved in creation of creation and the breath of God, I feel the power of the Holy Ghost, and the breath of God is in the body of every single person who's ever lived and will live, you who are born again, with Jesus residing in your body, we'll get to that in a minute, John 14. Every time you proclaim the gospel, every time you proclaim the good news, not tell people who drink, stop drinking, not tell people who smoke, stop smoking, not tell people who are in fornication and adultery to stop fornicating and adultery because they're not supposed to listen to you. They're supposed to be convicted by the Holy Spirit who's in you as you proclaim that they don't have to live condemn, be darkness, and live in sin. Here we go. But as many as received him, verse 13, to them he gave the right to become children of God. To those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh. Okay, who were born not of blood. Again, we've had this conversation. You are not born again, born again. You're not born, born again, nor of the will of the flesh. You cannot will yourself to be saved. Because if you can will yourself to be saved, that means you played a part in a part that you can't play because you're dead, you're darkness, right? Nor the will of flesh, nor the will of man. Meaning I can't make you saved. Your pastor, bishop, archbishop, prophet, evangelist, teacher cannot make you saved. If we can make you saved, then someone would have made me saved and someone would have made the other people saved. But it's by God. You have to be born of God. Okay? All right, here we go. John 14. If you love me, you will keep my commandment and I will pray the Father. Notice it say I'll pray to the Father, but pray the Father. That's a whole nother story. And he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive. Why can't the world receive the spirit of truth? Because the spirit of truth, which is the Holy Spirit, Jesus, the truth who came in. Yes, the truth. Yes. But you know him for he dwells with you. Let me go back. Let me go back. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. Right? You can't receive the Holy Spirit unless you're born again. So I've heard people say, oh, when they came, when that person came and, you know, gave their life to the Lord, wait, you're dead. You don't have a life. You mean you gave your dead self to the Lord. How does that work? How do you give yourself to the Lord? Help me understand. Again, I didn't grow up in church. So when I hear people say things and I go to scripture to look for the scripture, I gave my life to the Lord. First of all, the I part, anytime the I is involved, that's a whole nother story. You have no part in being saved. Let me rephrase that. So nothing is taken out of context. The role that you play in being saved is receiving the conviction of the Holy Spirit. What is the conviction of the Holy Spirit? The conviction of the Holy Spirit isn't stop sitting, stop smoking, drinking. All. That's not the conviction of the Holy Spirit. The conviction of the Holy Spirit is God, Jesus, that you were made through Jesus, the crucified Jesus. And you who are darkness comes and says, you do not have to live the life 
or live in the way that you've been living in debauchery. And even if you're not cheating on your wife, beating on your wife, cheating on your husband, drinking, smoking, because I know a whole lot of non-Christians who don't drink, who don't smoke, but they'll lie. Yes, because I don't know anyone who's not born again, who doesn't lie. Remember, the Bible says the devil is a liar. There's no truth in him. So for, again, side note, so for those who are around a lot of good people, right? Who are a lot of nice people and you don't share the gospel with them because they don't drink, they don't smoke, they don't sell drugs, they don't gang bang, they don't do any of that. Do you not realize that those same people who don't do any of those things consider themselves like God? And because you who are born again or who say you're born again, don't think that they need to have, hear the gospel, then you again are co-signing their darkness. Because of the life that I had, no one shared the gospel with me. No one said that I was going to go to hell for eternity because I didn't receive the conviction of the Holy Spirit. They said I would go to hell for eternity because I didn't go to church, but no one told me I was a sinner. So here we go. If you love me, keep my commandments and I will pray the father and he will give you another helper and that may have, and he may abide with you forever. That means dwell with you forever. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. And I will not leave you offerings. I will come to you. This is when you are born again. You receive Jesus Christ. You receive the Holy Spirit. Verse 15, and this is the amplified version. And I will ask the Father, ask the Father, and he will give you another comforter, counselor, helper, intercessor, advocate, strengthener. Oh, I'm so, you know, tired and then, oh, woe is me. Uh, yeah, that's a whole nother story. And stand by that he may remain with you forever. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, welcome take to its heart because it does not, the world, not see him or know or recognize him, but you know and recognize him for he lives with you constantly and will be in you. Holy Spirit, in you. Dwell in you. Now, if the Holy Spirit is in you, then my question is, how are you habitually sinning? <laughs> how is the Holy Spirit not telling you to stop sinning? How are you comfortable with sinning? I, I, don't, I don't understand. And again, conversations I had before I left for Turkey, conversations I had while I was in Turkey. Romans 8. For to be carnally minded is death. Can someone explain to me the carnal question? This scripture, and again, you can read um, one through five. But the conversation that I had, well, Beverly, you need to understand that they are carnal Christians. Okay. For to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. I, give you a second to read it. Seven, because the carnal mind is enmity against God. It doesn't say the devil is at enmity against God. It doesn't say demons are into the enmity against God. Because remember, the demons believe and they shut up. It says the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Verse six here, message version, five through eight. Those who think they can do it on their own end up obsessed with measuring their own moral muscle, but never get around to exercising it in real life. Those who trust God's action in them find that God's spirit is in them. Oh, I don't know if I could trust God. Okay, but anyway, living and breathing, obsession with self, look at me, follow me, 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 yes? Obsession with self, 
in these matters is a dead end. Attention to God leads out us out into the open, into the spacious free life. Focusing on the self is the opposite of focusing on God. Anyone completely absorbed with, absorbed in self ignores God. Let me just stop right there for a quick second. I will continue after the comma. If you are self-centered, you don't even know you're self-centered. Someone actually have to point it out. My dad used to say the most dangerous people are people who are ungrateful and selfish because you only focus on you. Everything is about you. Everything is about, everything is about you. And if not everything is about you, 70%, it's about you. Give me a word. What is God saying about me? Talk to me about me. Even if it's things that you're doing wrong, tell me about me. You don't give, forget, let's not even talk about giving. You don't proclaim God's goodness into anyone else's life except your own. Take a minute and think about the conversations you've had in the past 48 hours or three days or even the past week. How much of your conversation is about you and what you need? I'm going to leave it right there. Comma, ends up thinking more about self than God. That person ignores God, ignores who God is and other people and what he's doing. And God isn't pleased with or pleased at being ignored. Okay, let's go back here. Verse 10, I like the fact that this says, and if Christ, let me go back to nine, but you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed, if indeed, if for real, for real, the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he ain't his. You ain't his. And I'm not talking about, oh, you became a Christian, but now you got to get, um, get baptized in the Holy Spirit. I thought you had to be, you had the Holy Spirit in order to become a Christian. That's a whole nother story because I've met people. I have met people who said, well, you know, I became a Christian, but I just haven't been baptized in the Holy Spirit so I can have power. Hold on. So the Holy Spirit dwells in you, but it's not keeping you from sinning. So you now need to be baptized by the Holy Spirit to receive power from on high. Yes, there's the saving power of the Holy Spirit, just like there is the creation power of the Holy Spirit. And there is the baptism of the Holy Spirit to receive power on high. Hold on a second. But in the book of Acts, when the disciples in the upper room was baptized with fire, and they became born again, right? And then there was a baptism of fire and they received power and all of that. Just this whole thing of, oh, I became saved, but now I have to be. So how, how are you saved? Who, who saved you? When I say, help me, help me. Because again, conversations had this last week and even this week. Please, guys, if you need to give me a call so we can have this, this conversation, please give me a call if we have this conversation. Because meeting people in church who believe that they're saved and their lifestyle, forget about their lifestyle, the things that you say proclaims that you're not of Christ. Let me go back to these scriptures. But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed, if indeed. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness, right? It's life because of righteousness. Jesus Christ imputed righteousness into us when we became born again, because we received Jesus. Remember John 1. 11, but if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, meaning it's in you, it does not leave. Oh, that person took my peace. Jesus Christ is the prince of peace. How is the person taking Jesus from you? But anyway, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal body. You, your spirit, yes has become alive, right? But this scripture says here, he, God, 
who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you now. Someone said, well, Beverly, that's after we, that's after we, you know, we have our resurrected bodies. Okay, so wait a second. So you mean to tell me that in order for you to live right, you have to die and then be in heaven or be in Christ in eternity. That's that's what you're saying, or that's what people have said. They've said, you know, I, I just can't live right. And God just knows, you know, that we're just made of flesh and, and that we're, here we go. I'm going to say it. Wait for it. We're only human. Well, the Bible doesn't say that. It says we are to be as Christ is now in this earth realm. I refuse to use scripture to justify any behavior or thoughts that is antithetical to Christ in this word, Genesis to Revelation. And you have to make sure that you're not using scripture in order to justify your ineptness, inept ability to act like a Christian. Was that harsh? Yeah, I meant it. I meant it to be harsh. Because after saying something like this, this is when pastors or people who are ministers who will say, you know, I'm not trying to offend you. No, no, I really am trying to offend you. Oh, no, you know, I'm not trying to condemn anyone. No, I'm not. I, no one can condemn you. However, you can read this word and see that your life does not look like this word. People, this really is an update of what happened when I was in Turkey. And then I met Muslims who I had conversations with where they are cursing, smoking, drinking, dressing like prostitutes, literally dressing like prostitutes. And I'm like, you don't follow the Quran at all. So here I am in a predominantly, not predominantly, in a Muslim nation, seeing people with hadiths on, full garbs, tattoos, smoking. And someone shared that they've seen a whole lot of debauchery right outside the front of mosque. Okay, what does this have to do with everything that was that that happened? Let me stop sharing. This shirt says thousands locally, millions globally. People. We can't proclaim we are Christians and have Jesus Christ residing in our mortal bodies and not share the gospel, not preach the gospel. I'm not talking about just calling out sin. You can't call out sin to people who are in darkness because they're in darkness. So even if you call it sin, they don't believe in God. So they don't consider it sin. I'm talking about people who are in church buildings who believe because they are in church, because they have a pastor, because they have people who encourage them or even pray for them, that they believe that they're okay. I'll end with this. Why am I always talking about this? A month after returning to the United States for being gone for almost 11 years, I had a dream. In the dream slash vision, I was standing outside of a church building millions of people were coming out and they were all going. It was as if they, they were coming out going like this, right? They were coming out and I looked and everyone was going to hell that were going this way. And I'm screaming, no, no, that is the wrong way. And there were few people who were listening and they were going to the right, which now I realize is the right way. I didn't realize it was the right way. They were going to the right and they were going into a light that was brighter than any light that I've ever seen. And I was screaming, no, you're going the wrong way. No, you're going the wrong way. But they were all happy coming out of a church building or a building that has a cross on it. And then the more I screamed, there were other people that were going to the right they looked and they stopped and they started screaming. 
No, you're going the wrong way. No, you're going the wrong way. When I shared this during the Bible study, the global Bible study that we would have, there were people who were on that call who a month or two later after that Bible study came onto that Bible study and said they realized that they're not born again, that they're not a Christian. Yes, the Bible says we are to work out our own soul salvation with fear and trembling. But we who are in church buildings, who are calling people who are not our brothers and sisters Christians, we are co-signing their deception. And the way you keep from being deceived is being with a community of people who are born again believers who can tap you and say, something's off, something's not right. I am thankful to all of the apostles and pastors, mothers and fathers that I've had in, in, in this walk, who are no, some of who, who already passed on, who my first couple of weeks of meeting them, they were looking at me suspect. <laughs> Even after I told them how I was born again, they were like, okay, all right. Let's see. And then after a couple of months, they called me daughter. And I'm like, why did you wait a few, you know, months? I, I was born again. They was like, no, just checking. Just, just checking. So my, my prayer is that everyone who's listening to this, who's gotten to the end of this, who, who I felt like I was rambling, please read your scriptures. Please read these scriptures. And I hope that they are your scriptures. Know that you're loved. And thank you for listening. Bye.